So, interesting times that we're living in. Uh, we have been taking a little time this week um, away from our normal verse-by-verse uh, studies that we interdisperse throughout our you know daily podcast and now. We've been going through the book of Acts, we've been going through 1 John, um, but we've also been taking time this week to answer some questions that have come in, and hopefully that's been fruitful. And also, we have done a couple of prophecy briefs this week, and I'd like to do another one today. Um, and uh, shift gears a little bit. We have, uh, in, in the recent days, uh, part of the impetus with, uh, with uh, our increased number of uh, prophecy briefs this week, typically it's you know about every 10 days or two weeks or something, we might do one. But we did a couple this week, in particular because events in the Middle East have been ramping up dramatically. Uh, it seems like we are in kind of a different place than we've generally been when it's come to Israel and her neighbors, uh, Hamas and Hezbollah ultimately, uh, and uh, uh, Hamas, I should say, and uh, Islamic Jihad down in the Gaza Strip. Um, Hezbollah tends to be more geared toward the north. And um, but, uh, but in any case, um, Israel's ongoing conflicts with the Palestinians and those terror groups within them that are ultimately seeking uh, Israel's destruction and, um, and all that. And so as we see the conflict that has been increasing, we have turned our attention to that, to, to look at that, and to consider Ezekiel 38, 39, as, uh, as Ezekiel's prophecy describes a conflict that takes place in the last days, in the later days at least. We don't know exactly uh, how close it is to um, the rest of the events that unfold in the last days. But we do know that, um, that there is a conflict very specifically described there in Ezekiel 30 and 39. So we spent some time looking at that again because of the events taking place. And we're going to continue to watch that and continue to speak to that because, uh, again, it seems like we uh, are not only seeing this conflict increase, but it seems as though we've sort of crossed the threshold in regard to um, the, just the, the depth of, um, maybe not the depth is the right word, but the intensity of this conflict. In past times... Um, when uh, when uh, these rockets would come into Israel, they were generally kind of random. You'd see a few rockets come in, and Israel would respond and take out a you know a place that these rockets were fired from, and then uh, there'd be sort of a ceasefire and things would quiet down. However, um, the not only intensity but the just the sheer number of rockets, uh, and also not only the sheer number of rockets but the distances that some of these rockets coming from Gaza are now reaching into. Uh, Israel is becoming much more alarming, and Israel is recognizing now, uh, I think both in part with that barrage of rockets, that ongoing intense barrage of rockets that they're having to deal with, and um, the knowledge that they've kind of lost um, the very strong ally that they had in the previous administration in the United States and now find themselves um, pretty much facing this alone. Uh, They have kicked it up, uh, not just a notch, but a bunch of notches. And they are now telling uh, Hamas that they can either surrender or, or they will hunt down, uh, the, the IDF will hunt down every one of their leaders and put an end to this once and for all. Now that may be rhetoric, but it may not be, which means that as that intensifies in the region, we'll begin to start to see all the more prominently those players that are supporting Hamas, uh, uh, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, and such, uh, namely Iran. Um, also, uh, we mentioned in our last podcast on the subject that Turkey and Russia are also talking about how, I think we mentioned that, but uh, in the news, the idea that um, uh, Erdogan and Putin have been talking, and Erdogan is calling for the uh, Islamic nations around Israel to teach Israel a lesson. Well, of course, anyone who's, again, sensitive to the ideas that are presented in Ezekiel 38 and 39, our ears stick up a little bit, and we say, okay, are we going next level here? Are we actually maybe on the threshold of those events ultimately unfolding? key events I would watch for in the days to come is whether or not Israel attacks Damascus, if Damascus becomes uh, an even greater uh, threat in terms of uh, a location to launch rockets and missiles from, then Israel may have to decimate the city at some point, as spoken of in uh, Isaiah. And so that may be sort of the pin that uh, is pulled out of the grenade that kind of explodes the whole Middle East conflict that we read about in those chapters. But believe it or not, that wasn't my intention to go into that whole topic today, because as we've been doing that... Um, we're reminded again of what's going on there. Uh, that issue has never gone away. The fulfilling of those prophecies is still on track to happen at some point in the near future, I believe. But we have put on hold in doing that uh, something that we've been uh, been speaking about much more often, maybe even at the expense of talking about uh, the Middle Eastern issues, the uh, Middle East issues, um, and that is the idea of the Great Reset. 
and um, the move ever closer toward uh, one world governance, which the scriptures tell us will one day uh, rally together behind a leader that the Bible calls Antichrist or the man of perdition, the son of, uh, son of perdition, the man of sin, uh, speaks about him and his partner, uh, who is typically referred to as the false prophet. We read about them in uh, Second Corinthians. I uh, read about the Antichrist in Second Thessalonians chapter two. Uh, we read about them in Revelation thirteen and seventeen, nineteen, as Jesus returns and crushes that rebellion. But we've spent time talking about the Great Reset, uh, most recently and most prominently in regard to our prophecy updates, uh, because that's what has been going on. The World Economic Forum has been meeting and has been putting out ideas about um, this idea of fundamentally changing the nature of human life uh, around the world on a global scale. And that's not overstating it. Uh, as, and so I thought today what I would do is kind of revisit the Great Reset and kind of once again bring it to the fore. Now, we have spoken at great length on this subject in some other podcasts previously, uh, uh, um, you know, both in broad sense, but also in some of the more particular uh, points as well. But I never assume that people have gone back and watched any of those. So I think it's good just once in a while to take an episode and to sort of um, bring it back to the fore and explain it so that, um, you know, those who might be new to the subject or who maybe have been starting to hear some terms like Build Back Better or The Great Reset or the World Economic Forum. I don't think I've ever heard of that before, but now I'm hearing all about it. Who's this Klaus Schwab guy that I keep seeing on YouTube videos and stuff? Well, people that are just kind of getting introduced to these ideas, it might be worth sort of explaining them a little bit uh, at the expense of repeating some things that some of you may have listened to us talk about before. But I think it's worth it to once again uh, come back to it periodically and, and talk about it. So I thought today what I would do is explain the Great Reset, uh, what it's about, what it's supposed to touch on, and how it connects uh, with biblical prophecy and how it may connect, I should say, with biblical prophecy. Uh, when we seek to understand biblical prophecy, and we look at world events as they might connect to it, of course, we always uh, want to measure, uh, approach that with a measure of humility so that we don't get dogmatic saying this is this unless we can absolutely demonstrate that it is. Prophecy and biblical prophecy and understanding it as it connects to events going on around us sometimes can change and shift in that. And so we want to make sure that we understand that as we talk about these things. That's true not just for Bible teachers, but anybody who listens to Bible teachers and then goes out and starts to share these ideas. We always want to encourage a good measure of humility and say, you know, the scripture describes this going on. And without stretching the facts of what's going on in the world around us, it seems that this connects pretty solidly with what the Bible talked about in the last days. Now, in our day, I like to do prophecy briefs because there are so many different, or not just things, but even arenas in which these things are coming to pass, that it becomes very, very difficult uh, to not see uh, biblical prophecy being fulfilled in these things, or at least moving toward the, the, the place where they will be fulfilled ultimately. We know what the picture looks like in some sense from what the scriptures say. There will be a global leader. He will arise out of a uh, confederated, uh, ten-nation confederation, a revived Roman Empire. Uh, he will ultimately have a partner who will cause the world to bow down and worship an idol and worship him and an idol that's made to him. People will have to take a mark to buy and sell and, and, and to participate in a global community that is put together around this leader. Ultimately, this leader uh, binds the world together, not just in, in some sort of economic or political or social unity, but ultimately with a purpose. And that purpose is to stand against the Lord when he returns to establish his kingdom, which has been spoken about throughout the scripture and ultimately will come to pass. Uh, and, and that movement against the Lord when he comes behind the Antichrist is ultimately inspired and fueled by a, a character called the dragon in the book of Revelation. But we understand who the dragon is. He is, in fact, Satan, who has been seeking to steal, kill, and destroy throughout mankind's history. And in this last final attempt, uh, well, second to last attempt, and then last attempt after the Millennial Kingdom, uh, he seeks to ultimately do that. Uh, now, lots of questions are raised about that, uh, and we'll, uh, you know, in, in episodes to come, we'll take time and look at each of those ideas and stuff as they, as we do. But, uh, but in the broad scope of things, let's talk about the Great Reset, how it may in fact be um, uh, a means through which uh, we see biblical prophecy ultimately fulfilled. So what is it? What is the Great Reset? Well, the Great Reset is a movement to, again, change the fundamental nature of human life on earth in a number of different ways. 
uh, politically, uh, economically, environmentally, socially, and technologically. These are the five basic pillars that uh, present uh, or that that ultimately uphold this this movement and, and the changes that they seek. Uh, and and again, you can see just by the broad, uh, by the large topics that these are, you could see how okay, well, that does actually touch on an awful lot of uh, of, of of human life. So just briefly on each, um, politically, there is a move to uh, again create a global kind of a government that is not really led by nationalistically minded leaders uh, with countries with hard borders and stuff, but rather a global government that has the capacity to sort of oversee and bring uh, equality, equity, fairness uh, to all the citizens of the world so that there would not be uh, such gaps between the very rich and the very poor, but rather resources would be brought to bear in such a way where everybody basically is on the same level and nobody has to suffer and starve while others are rich uh, and getting richer and that kind of a thing. Sort of a Robin Hood kind of a mindset behind it, or as you know, we might call it uh, in in more recent times, sort of a communistic mindset. Uh, it's sort of a communistic slash socialistic mindset because communism is the idea that nobody owns anything. Nobody. There's no class society. Everybody sort of just plays their part, but there's not really a class, uh, and there's no real ownership of things because communally or the entire community owns all things. However, that's never worked on any kind of a large scale. You could argue that it might work on a very micro scale among maybe a family or a small, small community in some way where there's sort of a mutual understanding. But on a nationalistic level and certainly on a global level, it's never worked. And so, um, so instead of communism, there's, again, as we mentioned, sort of a socialist uh, element to this as well. And that is just simply where it's not a matter of nobody owning anything because everybody owns everything. It then becomes a matter of governments, leaders, people that are sort of managing these things, being the ones who manage what is in economic terms called the factors of production, the resources, the land, labor, and capital, and that kind of thing. Uh, this, of course, comes from ideas uh, that were best put forward by people like Karl Marx, uh, Friedrich Engels, and as they would write their, their various writings on this topic. Uh, speaking of the utopian society, the idea where, again, there's a classless society, However, in practical reality, since ultimately that can't happen, there needs to be some governing body that manages the resources and directs them and how they're used and makes the decisions about those things. Well, the Great Reset is essentially building toward that end. The idea that, um, and it's expressed through ideas that you may have heard in the news on, uh, it's, it's becoming a household phrase, but the idea of build back better. Uh, which is born of the idea that under the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic that has taken place, that there is a desire to not just go back to the way things were before the pandemic, but to come back in an entirely different way and build an entirely new society, one that is um, much more fair and equitable and this kind of a thing. So if you're wondering if we're ever going to go back, and we did a small series of three videos on this uh, called We're Not Going Back, Spoiler, that's about what I was going to say, is that if you think we're going back to the way things were, there's a very decided effort to not go back to the way things were, but to in fact come out and build back, not to what it was, but build back better. Um, our own President Biden and his own campaign, and even since the campaign, has spoken rather frequently about this idea. Now, we don't want to go back to the way things were, we want to go into something that's new, and again, fair for everybody. Um... Uh, and so politically, if we can, and, and economically, I've basically now kind of touched on the first two pillars, but if we can create a system of governance that is global in nature and <clears throat> where the economics of that, um, of that society are then uh, led by a particular group that we assume will be benevolent, that also has not really worked generally on a national scale, but, but that's the idea. And so politically, economically, these two topics are very intertwined anyway, and in describing them right now, I've kind of touched on both. Well, let's bring into it also the, um, the um, environmental element of it. In the green new economy that will be that is basically at the heart of the Great Reset, uh, we will basically work to remove all uh, pollution-based kinds of manufacturing and go completely green to where... Um, we're Mother Nature, Planet Earth. Our, the only home we have right now is, is 
uh, is ultimately at the very forefront of the thinking about decisions regarding things like manufacturing and building and such. And so therefore, the jobs that will be created throughout this, again, economics now connecting to environment, because in the Great Reset, these five pillars are all intimately acquainted. They're not five separate things. They are five ideas that are intrinsically linked together, and you, you really can't not have all of them as part of it. Uh, it's pervasive. Well, in the economic uh, uh, environment of that time, pun intended, uh, the jobs will be grain. They'll be service-oriented. They'll be computer-based. They'll be home-based. Uh, people will not work in large pollution-causing buildings so much, but more people will work at home. And, uh, and they will work uh, with technology and stuff as opposed to uh, factories that pu push out all kinds of smoke and everything. And even factories themselves will have to be converted to, converted to green uh, kinds of things. In our own elections and in our own politics, I should say, we've, uh, we've had uh, people very vocally speak about the idea that everything from transportation to even buildings themselves need to be refurbished, um, rethought, reworked, reset into something that is uh, environmentally friendly and does not do any damage uh, to the environment, uh, but instead uh, is something that creates an environment where the environment can be healthy, strong, and ultimately unaffected by man's footprint. And so we see this in um, uh, writings by, uh, and I was, uh, I, I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about the person who's at the heart of uh, the World Economic Forum's move toward a great reset, uh, a global great reset. And it's a gentleman by the name of Klaus Schwab, and you may have heard his name too. He is the founder of the World Economic Forum, uh, and since the 70s when he founded it, he's been at the head of it, remains the head of it, the chairman of it. And, uh, and, and he speaks prolifically on this idea. As a matter of fact, in the last few years, he has written prolifically on it. Uh, his uh, book from a few years ago was called The Fourth Industrial Revolution. I think that's backwards, isn't it? But uh, that's how my camera works. But anyway, so The Fourth Industrial Revolution. And this describes not only the trending that the world is moving toward, but also begins to maybe more than predict, but seek to drive the world in a way that, um, that changes the way that we do industry, where it's much more of a, uh, a computer-based, internet-based, interlinked um, uh, kind of a world where, um, where technology takes a far greater leap. The Industrial Revolution uh, of past created machines and railroads and all these kinds of things. Well, the Fourth Industrial Revolution is going to be one that is much more based on the uh, ecology and those kinds of things. More recently than that, um, after the COVID pandemic uh, took off, and when I say pandemic, by the way, um, some of you are saying, no, it's a pandemic and all that kind of thing. I get it. Um, on the one hand, I don't deny at all that it's a real disease, that it does affect people. Typically, most typically, 90% of the time, it affects people that have pre-existing conditions. However, that's still a problem because if someone has those pre-existing conditions and they get COVID, they are much more susceptible, or if they're elderly and get COVID, uh, they are much more susceptible to feel the effects and the harm and even uh, it could take their lives. It's a real thing. However, my issue uh, has always been, since we've come to understand it and seen the way that society and, and governments have responded to it, typically under the leadership of the World Economic Forum and the World Health Organization and the various connections that they have and, and organizations and people that sort of are at the heart of connecting um, um, these people and resources and, and, uh, uh, and organizations, um, the response through this has been so far overbearing compared to the disease itself. I just saw a statistic today that said obesity uh, kills about 2.8 million people a year. And so we're not telling people they can or can't eat, although I guess we're kind of starting to with our plant-based foods and that kind of thing. But the idea that the pandemic is a real thing, I don't argue that. Uh, the, the disease is a real thing. Pandemic now becomes not just the disease, but the way we respond to it as well. And his book, COVID-19 and the Great Reset, um, uh, I read both of these and uh, continue to go back and kind of dog ear things and underline stuff. Um, if you are so inclined to know from the, uh, from the playbooks, essentially, of the thinking behind the movements that we see happening today, which are clearly extremely pervasive, extremely influential, and are also um, global in scope, and, uh, and such, then these are a couple of books you'll probably want to familiarize yourself with, 
or at the very least, uh, watch some of the um, some of the things uh, on YouTube or any of the other outlets where you can watch or listen uh, to some of the various meetings, speeches given by Klaus Schwab, uh, Q and A sessions, discussions. You can uh, still watch um, uh, sessions from the Davos meeting that took place a couple of months ago, um, and you can get a sense of where we're going. This is where the world is moving. Uh, and that, that organization, World Economic Forum, and these meetings um, uh, in Davos, Switzerland, and, and in Lucerne coming up, um, these meetings are attended virtually, I mean, in other words, online, like a Zoom kind of a meeting, um, by leaders from all over the world. Uh, Prince Charles, for example, one of them, a, a major figure in the moving forward of these ideas. Uh, and others as well. Angela Merkel has, has tipped her hat to this. Uh, you know, uh, um, our current president, no resistance at all from our current administration from these moves that are going. There's some, some rhetoric, but not really any full-throated uh, move away from these ideas. Um, Joe Biden, our current president, was vice president under President Obama, who was a very uh, clear globalist in that. Uh, and that's not just a democratic thing, by the way. You know, for those of us who used to, um, uh, who have studied prophecy for some time, are familiar with things like um, um, uh, the, uh, the, you know, we talk about people like the, um, the uh, oh gosh, I just uh, stuck my foot in it now. The, um, it, pre- it, it preceded the, uh, it was like, you know, um, oh shoot, it'll come to me as I'm talking here. But um, it's right on the tip of my tongue. But organizations like these that were kind of the predecessors to these organizations and um, the Council on Foreign Relations, thank you, uh, that, that's what I was just thinking of here. Uh, Council for Foreign Relations, um, all these different ideas uh, and organizations, I should say. Back in the days, uh, in many, for, for many years now, organizations like that were, uh, were, uh, were manned by people on both parties. Uh, this is not just a, a, a left or Democrat or right or conservative. This is a blend of both parties that are interested in these ideas. Uh, and so uh, I would not expect that our country in the West here in the United States would ultimately put up a lot of resistance. Our previous administration was kind of an anomaly in that regard. Um, and uh, he was very, uh, Trump was very nationalist, nationally minded, you know, America first and those kinds of things. Well, that became a major problem uh, when it came to the World Economic Forum. The dogs say hi. Um, uh, because he was about America first and not globalism. Well, that probably had a lot to do with why he's not president anymore. Uh, but that being said, the world is moving in a very concerted direction toward these things. Let me come back and finish the last two uh, pillars of, uh, of the Great Reset and then begin to tie this together a little bit. Uh, the fourth pillar was social, the idea of creating a society that is socially moved in a direction that lines up with these principles. Well, again, it, it, speaking of the pandemic and that kind of thing, one of the things that the pandemic did is that it conditioned all of us to sort of uh, get used to the idea of working separately, being at home, working virtually, doing video meetings and that kind of thing, being socially distanced. Uh, masks that don't allow us to communicate on, on the kind of human level that we have always had. Now that has been removed or, uh, you know, there's some resistance to it now. You know, our own, uh, the CDC, I should say, has uh, just said that if you're, if you're fully vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask anymore. Joe Biden just, our president just made a comment that here's the choice. You can either get the vaccines or stay masked. It's your choice kind of a thing. That should bother lots of people, hearing that kind of thing from a president of a free society. Um, but anyway, um, without going too far in that direction, um, at some point, the next strain, the next opportunity to scare everybody into putting masks back on will come. And once again, we'll go back to where we were uh, and that kind of thing. Well, that that has an impact. Children growing up with that kind of thing are being psychologically affected by this. And we'll see the, uh, the, the ultimate impact of that in the days to come. But a society that understands that it is good to not be together or is being conditioned to think it's good to not be together because we're keeping each other safe. Fear, again, is a great motivator for these things. Uh, not only that, but you've, we've also got a society, globally speaking, that has started to become very, very accustomed to the idea of government taking care of us. 
Uh, Not we taking care of ourselves, but us learning dependence upon the government. Now, any countries around the world that have been predominantly socialist-minded have sort of grown up under this. There's a certain amount of this that is comfortable and, and, and just the way it is for lots of countries around the world. Countries that have gone extreme socialist have collapsed and have gone into massive inflation and things like that. But countries that have sort of a blend of socialism and, and, and capitalism, but a strong bent on, on, on the government taking care of lots of the basic everyday things of life, are sort of conditioned already for this sort of thing. In the United States, we are very not conditioned for that, but are becoming increasingly conditioned for this. Um, You know, the Fifth Amendment, which provides for private property ownership and protects it, is fundamental to our beliefs as Americans. Uh, And it's fundamental to the idea of capitalism. If you don't own things, you can't buy and sell things. And so therefore, private ownership is very, very important. Uh, it's fundamental. It's a, it's a core ideal value that we believe that, um, that all people should have. Um, but in the recent days, that has been eroded away to the point where people are willing to give up their rights for the sake of feeling safe, uh, whether it's the freedom to not mask or whether it's the freedom to let your business continue to stay open during a pandemic. Um, you know, just today in Florida, uh, there's a few business owners who are being pardoned by the governor there. Uh, because previously the laws were such where they, it was illegal for them to have their businesses open during the pandemic. Well, the governor has, has since pardoned them and has removed those restrictions. But for a while there, we're starting to just get used to the idea that if the government thinks that the economy needs to be put on hold for a while so we can all stay separate and stay home and people that have physical labor kinds of jobs can't go to work, then that's just what we have to do to be safe. Well, the collateral damage of that is that the economics of a society are one of the fundamental undercurrents of a society. And if you take away people's ability to make a living, how are they supposed to eat, pay their mortgages, um, buy the necessities they need and those kinds of things? Well, here comes the stimulus package or packages uh, where the government starts giving out food, I mean, paychecks uh, for people, uh, in order to um, sustain them during this pandemic and the effects that have shut down our economy. Don't worry, the government's here to help you. Well, wait a minute. The only reason we're in this problem is because the government far overreacted to the effects of the pandemic. Now, I will grant that in the opening months, nobody really understood, at least generally people in society didn't understand it. Of course, this is the point at which the question comes up, was, this, was the pandemic put in place in order to bring these other things about? Uh, I won't give a full-throated yes, but, you know, the more, the more you dig into these things, you realize that this is, this is a tool that is being used to bring us to a particular kind of end. And so, uh, again, I don't, uh, I know everyone's up in arms about the term conspiracy theory and that kind of thing, but I I don't have a better term for it at the moment, so I'll just use it. But I'm not a conspiracy theory person, but the idea of conspiracy is that somewhere in the shadows, something's happening that only a few people have discovered. But these things are becoming, this end, this goal, this desire to great, to to create this environment where there's a great reset and everything in society is shifted in a new direction. This is so openly spoken about now. And the fact that the pandemic is being seen by those propagating these ideas as the great window of opportunity, that's the very term that, um, that um, you know, uh, Klaus Schwab uses and others use. This is a great window of opportunity that we must take advantage of because we don't know if we'll always have it. Okay, well, if that's true, then how do we separate that from the possibility that this was put here so that these ideas could be put forth? So again, um, um, let me bring it back around to the final um, uh, pillar of the uh, Great Reset, and that is technological change, a Great Reset technologically. This now, believe it or not, speaks to the idea of not just technological growth. Hey, everybody's online now. There's going to be satellites all around the world, so everybody's got high-speed internet and those kinds of things. There's a part of that that I dig. I mean, I, I 
grew up as a Star Trek fan, right? So the idea of technology and cell phones and all this stuff and everything on the one hand is very, very cool. I'm not sure I'd want to necessarily go back to writing on papyrus or anything like that. I like being able to just pull my phone out and look up anything I want in, in, in any given moment. I love the fact that I can use my phone to make these podcasts and send them around the world. I think that's pretty cool. I think that's kind of amazing. But it's not the fourth industrial revolution is not just about increases in that kind of technology and availability of that technology, but it is also about the idea of blending technology with biology, uh, enhancing human beings to become better versions of themselves. Building back better touches on the idea of human beings being better having the capacity to live longer, um, having nanobots in our bodies that can not only um, uh, diagnose us, but can deliver medications or, uh, or gene affecting kinds of things that can maybe, you know, in their minds, in the minds of the technologists, uh, create a society of people that are somewhat symbiotic with flesh and technology that are better versions of themselves. Um, you know, there, there's... Um, there's a phenomenally insightful quote from Jurassic Park. I can never resist a pop culture reference when it works, but there's a great quote, and some of you already know where I'm going on this. Jeff Goldblum is Dr. Ian Malcolm. He's a chaotician, and they're sitting around in a room with John Hammond, the creator of Jurassic Park, the one who took DNA from a mosquito and created and re returned dinosaurs to the earth and all this kind of thing. And they're talking about it all in terms of a theme park and how great this will be and all this. And Ian Malcolm speaks up and says something insanely insightful and says, you know, uh, you, you took the technology and the, the knowledge that was earned by others and you did the next step. You did what was natural. You went the next step with it. And before you knew it, you were slapping it on a lunchbox and everything. And no one ever stopped to think that just because you could, no one stopped to ask whether or not you should. I mean, they should have just stopped the movie for a few minutes right there and just let that mind bomb sink into everybody's head for a minute. But that, that, is, uh, that is really insightful. The technology that we have the capacity to create and implement uh, is moving at such a fast pace. And the decisions about how these things are being put in place are not being made by everybody. They're being made by few, by some. A great example of this recently was, um, you know, these... Uh, these enhanced mosquitoes that have now been released to try and fight mosquitoes and disease. Um, it's been in development for a long time, funded by the Gates, uh, Bill Gates, if not the Gates Foundation. I can't remember if it's the foundation or just he personally did that. Um, you know, and the idea sounds awesome. I hate mosquitoes. You get little technologically enhanced ones that don't sting and don't irritate and don't pass disease and everything, killing off the ones that do. There's a part of me that says, yay, mosquitoes are from hell anyway. But, uh, but on the other hand, um, you know, maybe these ideas have been thought through really far, but, you know, do we know if there's any lasting impact to the mosquitoes disappearing? I don't know. I, maybe there is, maybe there isn't some studies on that. Uh, Bill Gates also, speaking of Bill Gates, also uh, mentioned the idea of creating sort of this layer of cloud over the earth that will stop UV rays from bringing harm and uh, those kinds of things. Okay, now wait a minute. You're talking about I mean, the, the fact that an idea that we might put something around the whole planet. Okay, we've, we've kind of jumped a quantum leap ahead in our thinking here. And the fact that the idea has been put out there means that any discussions about it in the future will seem less mad science-y and more plausible because it's out there now. It's out in the world. People can talk about it, think about it, get over their aversion to it. And now we can kind of get through that period where everybody thinks this is some kind of mad scientist, crazy, godlike mindset that, that, that Bill Gates has. And eventually we get used to this and it becomes like, okay, well, let's give it a try over here. And then let's try it over here and over here. Um, uh, we're, we're moving in directions so fast uh, that are not just technological, but the way that we are thinking about things now, uh, what did it say in Genesis? You know, when they, um, you know, were, I think it was when they were building the Tower of Babel, right? You know, now nothing that they conceive of will they not be able to do and this kind of thing. Um, that, and that was not a good thing. That was an indictment because man's heart is wicked and evil continually. This is what is inside of us. And if we believe that we can sort of play God, small g, but play God with 
the world around us, I mean, literally on a, on a full political globally, environmentally globally, all these kinds of things, um, changing even what it means to be a human being. You know, these are ethic questions that now come up. Like if we, if we create AI that is self-aware, is it a person? Does it have a soul? Does it have, uh, is it a, is it, should it be considered a person? Is a person who has technological enhancements, what is that, how does that redefine the idea of personhood now and things like that? These are real questions that we, that we have been dealing with, with for a while. I mean, ethicists have been talking about these things for a long, long time, but now it's happening in a way where it's not like just theory anymore. Now we actually have to grapple with these ideas. Now, some at this point might be listening and saying or watching and saying, well, what's wrong with this? I mean, why not have a global unity? Why not use technology to enhance us and make us better? Why not, why not even rally around a global government that is bringing forth these ideas and helping humanity to take a quantum leap forward? What's wrong with that kind of thing? Why, why wouldn't we want that? Well, and I'll tell you, there's something, again, even as a sci-fi nut, I, 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 there are elements of this that to me just seem cool and interesting or whatever, but I have to remember that what lies at the heart of man is something that God has made known to us. The move in this direction is one that is not really in any way um, seeking to involve the God of creation in it. This is a movement completely other than the one who created all of this. Uh, and this isn't just sort of sour grapes, like it's just not fair. Now, if they just had a religious component, that would be great. Because the truth of the matter is, is that this government, when it finally does come together, this global government behind the Antichrist, it will be a spiritual, there will be a spiritual element to it. If you look at uh, 2, Corinthians, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Revelation 13, we find that the Antichrist is somebody who demands to be worshipped above all that is called God. The false prophet is a religious leader who gets people to worship the Antichrist, or as he's called in Revelation 13, the beast. As a matter of fact, the world becomes so enamored with him after an assassination attempt is made on his life, and he uh, comes back from the dead, and he lives through it, and everybody is in wonder saying, who is like the beast? Who can do battle with him, or who can stand against him, and this kind of thing? And he becomes worshipped. As a matter of fact, again, the, the false prophet makes an image of the Antichrist that, that the false prophet has the ability to bring to life. Uh, now, some people, when they see that, they think, oh, this is holograms and AI technology and stuff. I don't think so, because we have certain amounts of that kind of thing now where, you know, we're sophisticated enough, generally speaking, to know that technology is capable of doing that kind of thing. So we wouldn't be in wonder of this if we knew sort of how the trick was done. I think this is a spiritual thing. The, the Antichrist, the false prophet, the first beast, the second beast, they're empowered by Satan. And he gives them the ability to do signs and wonders, much like he has people like Janus and Jambres back in the book of Exodus and that, these magicians that stood against Moses. Um, he has the power to deceive and do spiritual kinds of things that would just bring the world to a place of awe and wonder. And it's for this reason that they ultimately are so enamored that they say, who can stand up to the beast? Of course, they won't call him the beast. They'll call him by whatever title he has at the time. Um, but the idea is that it will be not only these five pillars, but there actually will be a spiritual element to it. And the world will buy in. So this begins to answer the question, what's wrong with a society that wants to move this way, wants to embrace the Great Reset and just see all these global changes to make mankind more equitable and fair and better physically and, and, uh, and even spiritually, you know, as we rally around this, this leader who is claiming deity in this kind of thing. Well, the problem ultimately lies in that this is a move of total rebellion against, again, the true and living God who gave us all of this. God gave us the world. God created it for us to enjoy. He gave it to us that we might uh, live life and enjoy and all this as we walk with him, the creator of these things, as he allows us and brings us to a place of knowing him, as he draws us close to himself, we understand the ins and outs of life better. We, uh, matter of fact, uh, you know, without getting on a side thing, scientists for years, uh, believing scientists took those ideas that the creation had to have uh, a creator because of the order and the, uh, the, both on the grand scale and on the micro scale and this kind of thing. 
And so they would make their discoveries. They would plumb the depths knowing that there was a sensible reason why things were the way they were. Why? Because they were made by a sensible creator. Well, this movement moves away from all of that and puts man in the place of the creator. Uh, We're now enhancing people, you know. I find it fascinating how much of a counterfeit Satan is. He's trying to create a global kingdom that is ruled by a leader with a spiritual sidekick who is ultimately empowered by somebody behind the scenes. It's a sort of a, uh, a demonic counterfeit to the real story of how things will go, where the Son of God will sit on a throne in Jerusalem over a millennial kingdom. Uh, ultimately, his subjects come to him through the power of the Holy Spirit, and, and ultimately, God the Father is the one who has set these things in motion and everything. Of course, I'm not diminishing the Trinity, the triune nature of God, but in the biblical understanding of, of sort of the... Uh, the mechanics of this whole thing, we see here that the saint is really trying to imitate the actual Trinity and the activities of the Trinity. Even the idea that um, the Antichrist dies and comes back to life, sort of a, uh, whether it's a real resurrection or a mock resurrection, it's an, it's an imitator to the one who truly died and rose again and lives evermore. Um, and so Satan is constantly trying to put things up that are close enough to give us a sense of spiritual connection in this kind of a thing, but always shy of the real McCoy. Why? Because from the beginning, his desire was to be like the Most High. And this is the way that he gets mankind not to worship God, but as many as he can to worship him, himself. And so what's wrong with it? In a word, it's rebellion. It ultimately, as a matter of fact, in in Revelation 19, we see where Jesus is returning to the earth to establish his kingdom. Daniel speaks eloquently about this coming kingdom uh, of the Messiah that will never end. It will ultimately strike at these kingdoms that exist. And Revelation says all these kingdoms will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And as Jesus comes to set right all that is wrong in the world, as he comes to uh, rule over a world where sin will not be allowed to persist, but he will deal with it with a rod of iron. It will be dealt with authoritatively right away. Um, as he comes to return to establish this, those who rally, mankind behind Antichrist, will seek to stop him. That's ultimately where this goes. That is the direction that we're going in. That's ultimately where the world will be. Uh, and in this ultimate example of rebellion against the God who created them, they'll seek to stop him from coming and being the Lord of his creation. It's, it's, it's blasphemous. It is arrogant beyond any description. Um, and it's inspired by Satan himself. So as we move forward, as we continue to watch events unfold around us, um, we want to watch with a careful eye because the scriptures again tell us where we're going. I've just given sort of a thumbnail sketch of it. I'll put notes in the, you know, in, uh, under the video. You'll be able to see passages that you can read. I'll also link some videos where we've spoken about this before, but some other videos that will uh, give you links to, to what the Fourth Industrial Revolution is all about, to Klaus Schwab talking about uh, the Great Reset and those kinds of things. Let those be beginning points for you if you've not already begun to look into these things. And even if you have, they can be helpful. But if you're kind of new to all this, this becomes sort of a place you can start to investigate these things. And come to your own conclusions. That's fair. I mean, I'm not going to tell you what you have to do or anything, but I do pray that you would use these resources to come to a fuller understanding of what's going on around us. It almost sounds insane to think that this could really be happening. You know, I'm, I'll be 53 in a couple of months, and uh, I, I, which means I've grown up in a time where the inklings of some of these things were starting to happen even before I was born. But we have moved in just my lifetime from this stuff being far out, crazy conspiracy, Illuminati kinds of stuff to where we're literally reading about it, watching it on videos and not doctored videos, but just watching people in these movements speak openly about it. We're living in a time when a pandemic has basically brought global society to its knees where we have now begun to look to certain leaders to help us find our way through. Well, we're going to want to reward those leaders in the end by essentially being allegiant to them. Um, I say we, I'm saying as a global society. I'm not. I I, I hopefully you as a believer are not. Um, You know, yes, the Bible says we should 
respect the authorities and that kind of thing. But at some point, when the authorities begin to violate uh, the truth of God, we have to stand back now and say, okay, I can't go any further on this. It's like uh, Peter and John did in Acts. Um, we're not going to have to look for opportunities to do that. They're going to come. And we'll have to decide if we're standing with the world around us or with the Lord. And that is a tough question depending on the situation you're in because sometimes we make a thing of something that doesn't have to be a thing. And we don't want to just be obnoxious for obnoxiousness sake. You know, Peter said, you know, don't, you know, it's, it's one thing if you're persecuted for righteousness sake, but if you're persecuted because you're a troublemaker or something, that's kind of your issue. We don't want to be like that. But there may come a point, and I think as the kingdoms of this world resist the coming kingdom, we're just going to be forced to have to choose what side we're on. And it may cost us greatly to do so. But at the end of the day, like Paul would say in Philippians, the things here are temporal, you know? At some point, we're going to have glorified bodies. We're going to be in the kingdom. We're going to be in heaven after that. Ultimately, we're going to stand through the judgment that will come and we'll be alongside of him and in his presence forever. This life is temporal. It's temporary. It's not something to be hold, held on to. It's not something to be invested in deeply. It is something to, rec- it's something to be recognized for what it is. Temporal, passing away, and currently under the sway of the wicked one, or the prince of the power of the air, and such. And we are seeing his footprints and his fingerprints all over society and all over the direction society is going. And so we want to be spiritually prepared for that. We want to settle our allegiance, recognize that our citizenship is first and foremost and eternally in heaven. This is just where we work, but one day we'll go home. So that said, let me close in prayer again. This was just kind of a refresher uh, or maybe sort of a primer for those who are new to this idea. Really just intended to be something to kind of remind us of what's going on and to kind of keep at the fore the fact that we are living in times that require us to be biblically astute, to be biblically aware, to again, settle our allegiance. What kingdom are we really part of and what are we investing ourselves into? Um, so I'll leave it with that and I'll close in prayer and I'll invite you that, uh, uh, if you'd like, you can leave comments, questions, uh, in the comments section below on our YouTube channel here. Uh, if you, um, uh, if you'd like to go to my website at parsonspad.com, you can also watch these videos there. You can comment, you can email me from there as well at brian at parsonspad.com with an I, Brian with an I. And then, uh, you can also subscribe to our audio version of this. I know that these are blazing crazy videos and they're so, you know, over the top, you just can't not watch them. But no, there's really nothing. If you're just listening to the audio, you're not missing anything. It's just me sitting here in front of a camera. But if you want to just listen to the audio version instead of uh, uh, watching the video, you can subscribe on my website as well at parsonspad.com. Uh, if you want to watch these on Odyssey, you can do that as well. And I'm going to continue to add various outlets that uh, you'll be able to link to from my website. And of course, uh, it's important to be in community as believers. And so if you are able to be part of a church family, please do that. Please be alongside of other believers if it's at all possible. In the days that come, you don't want to have to be an island if you have a choice. Uh, Some people I know that watch this podcast are kind of in a place where they don't have a Bible teaching church nearby. And I'm thankful that we can sort of interact this way and have community, at least in this way. But if you're able to connect with the body of believers... I really strongly encourage you to do that, especially Bible-believing, prophecy-believing, Bible-teaching, prophecy-teaching churches that that will help you discern what's going on from a biblical perspective, what's what's happening in the world around us, and and that you be be alongside of like-minded believers that are wanting to hunker down and be ready and active uh, in in kingdom work until the the day that Jesus comes to get us. Um, so do that. But if you can't, if, if you're in the Tennessee area, in Middle Tennessee, somewhere around Franklin, we encourage you to come on out to our church at Calvary Chapel Franklin. And you can go to our website, calvarychapelfranklin.com. And you can learn about us. You can find out where we are. You can, um, you know, um, come and worship with us. Come grow alongside of us. And, um, and so, and, and by all means, thank you for watching. And, uh, and I, I hope you'll continue. And as we go through the word together, as we talk about these things together, um, it's, it's a joy to be with brothers and sisters, at least in this way, uh, if we as as often as we can. I'm thankful for y'all, and uh, and uh, and that you watch and that you engage in all those kinds of things. So, let me pray as we close. Father, we're thankful for the days that you've called us to live in. Like Esther, who was called for such a time as that, we understand that we're not here by accident either. This is the time that you've called us to be in, and you've called us to be students of the Word, and to be lovers of the God of the Word. 
And so, Father, as we come to know you, as we come to know Jesus, as we walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and come to know him better as well, as we open your word and study it as the basis, the source of our understanding about you and about your purposes, your plans, your ways, help us to read your word on a number of levels. Help us to read it devotionally, to let it be a worshipful experience as we read your word and wonder at the awesomeness of who you are. But help us also to be students of the deep things as well, to dive in, to dig in, to connect the dots and understand, to apply ourselves to rightly dividing the word of truth. Sure, that's what pastors need to do and Bible teachers. But as simple believers in Christ, just simply those who want to walk with you, help us too to approach the scripture that way. Father, we are so thankful that one day, in spite of anything that might come down the road here, that there is a shelf life to this world. One day we'll get to go home and be with you. One day Jesus will come and snatch us out of this world and bring us to our true home. We also thank you that we'll get to rule and reign alongside of him as believers and participate in the things that are going on in that kingdom when he establishes it. We thank you that when the judgment does come, and we pray for all of those who are outside of Christ right now prior to that judgment coming, that through your power, through your Holy Spirit, by your word, by the testimony and witness of those that are walking with you now, that we'd see many, many people come into the kingdom in these days. We know that even after we're gone, that you will still be working uh, through Israel, through your, uh, those that you've anointed from Israel, those who are sealed uh, among the, tw- the 12 tribes that ultimately will be, will, will, be, will be around at that time. And we thank you for the angel that will preach the gospel in the skies during that period of time. It just reminds us that even in this time where you're bringing judgment on the world, you still are giving opportunity for people to come and be saved. Father, that just blesses our heart to know that when that judgment comes, we thank you that As believers today, we won't have to be subject to that because Jesus took our wrath upon himself and we've escaped it. Father, help us to cling to these hopes. Help us to cling to you. Help us to live each day in the knowledge that this might be the day that we get to see you. And so as a result of that, teach us to walk in such a way as to bring you glory through our words, through our works, through our activities, through our service, through our worldview, through the way that we interact with those around us, believers and unbelievers alike. Father, we just pray that you'd use us in these days because, again, you've called us for such a time as this. Thank you, Father. We love you. We praise you. We bless you. And thank you for helping us to see the difference between this world and the aims and goals and directions it's going and the difference between that and the world that is to come. Father, we praise you. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.